of the matter. Today we're talking about maternal mortality and child health. These are very, very important uh, subjects in our nation. Um, the, the, the most recent statistics I have is that the child or the maternal mortality rate in Nigeria is 10%. That means that one in every 10 women dies in the process of childbirth. Um, to, to discuss this with me today is Adekpaju Jayoba, who is the founder of Brown Button Foundation. Brown Button Foundation is, is set up specifically to improve maternal health and child health in our country. Uh, Adipaju, you're welcome to the heart of the matter. Thank you very okay. much. Um, well, first of all, Brown Buttons, tell us how that came about. Um, Brown Button was established in 2011 to deal with the issue of maternal and child mortality in Nigeria. Um, it was established to help put a focus on goals four and five of the Millennium Development Goals, you know, that was set in 2000. So Brown Button Foundation, essentially, we work in rural communities because that is where the mortality rates are very high. You know, that, that's where they are really very high. That, that, so that, those are the areas that we work. So Brown Button basically trains traditional birth attendants. We train skilled birth attendants. We work with different uh, governments at different levels to help them set up linkages between the birth, skilled birth attendants and the traditional birth attendants. Tell me, yeah. why did you start? What motivated you to start Brown Buttons? Okay, so Brown Button was started as a result of um, a personal loss. It was the death of a friend at childbirth. You know, I'm, she was very promising. She had like the whole world ahead of her. She was goal oriented. She was focused and everything just disappeared overnight. In one night it was over. She was dead and her baby was alive. And this happened in the city. This happened in a well-established hospital. This happened to someone I would never have thought that, you know, it could happen to. So it got me thinking that if someone like this that is very educated, that has, you know, the opportunity to have the best doctors, the best hospitals. If she can die at childbirth, what is happening in the villages? What is happening in the rural communities? That was when I took a better look at the statistics, you know, regarding maternal death. And that death, the personal loss, put a face on every figure that I saw. When they say 10% of women, 10 in every, one in every 10 women in Nigeria, I know it is one in every 10 because I've, I've, I've experienced it. I've, I've seen someone die. There's a personal loss for me, so I can easily identify with it. Now, what is the typical cause of maternal death? Well, it depends. I, I would say it depends because in our work over the years, we've seen that you know every area does not usually have the same factor. When you look at the rural areas, it's a different factor entirely. When you look at the cities like Lagos, it's a totally different factor. When you look at Lagos, you'll be looking at factors like medical negligence. You know, you'll be looking at factors what, like... What are the kind of negligent things that happen? Okay, I'll, I'll give an example. We've had this case where the mother did not actually die, but the child suffered from cerebral palsy. The child is presently, you know, suffering from cerebral palsy as a result of medical negligence. This woman reports to the hospital, attended at Natal, reports to the hospital on time, only for her to find out that the doctors are not available. It's a government hospital. Doctors were not available. So she got transferred to another government um, hospital where the doctor told her, look, we don't do surgeries on Thursday, so I would not be able to, you know, take your delivery today. And she had to wait till the next day. And then the, do the husband transferred her back to the first hospital because the doctors were back there, you know, took her back there only for her to have the baby. And now the baby is two years plus now. The baby cannot sit properly, cannot talk, cannot walk, cannot hold, cannot see clearly cannot even hear clearly and the baby suffers from epileptic seizures due to the cerebral palsy. So those are the situations where you find in the cities where doctors are either overworked or not too committed. Where doctors have like, where doctors do like two, three jobs, you know, just to keep body and soul together to take care of their families. Where consultants, you know, for instance, work in the government hospital but also run their own private clinics. So, you know, there's a divided attention. There, there's no focus, you know. So that, those are the problems that you grapple with in the um, okay. urban areas like this. So that's negligence? Yes. What are the other causes? When you look at the rural areas, the problem of access. You know, so you have... just aren't the hospitals? Oh my, no hospitals. 
and where you have the hospitals. For instance, we've worked in communities where the health centers don't open every day. They open like two times a week or three times a week. And when you go there on that day, there's no assurance that you'll meet any nurse. She has probably gone to do some business or something else. And even where you find the nurses, they don't have the facilities. Like we worked in a community, in Latawa community, where we had to speak to the um, House of Representative member there to help them build a hospital. You know, because these people were working miles to access healthcare services. They were working miles for delivery. They were going to a separate town entirely to go and have their deliveries there. And th that was for those who were keen on having skilled birth attendants. Otherwise, you know, you would just walk into the place of a traditional birth attendant and, you know, take your he takes your delivery. If you're lucky enough, you survive, you know, and move on with life. That's, that's just how it is. What is a traditional birth attendant? Now, a traditional birth attendant, from our experience we've seen, is a person who, because over the years, has been taking delivery as a result of the fact that, you know, it's, it's a trade. He, as a result of the fact that he has learnt it from someone, maybe from his father, from his mother, or maybe out of the fact that, look, what can I do? I've been around, I've been at home, I need to do some work, I can't farm. So let me go and learn how to take delivery. You know, and so you enroll somewhere, or you go and meet somebody, and then you start taking delivery. You know, you convert a room in your house, and, you know, you use herbs to help them make sure that... You know, for a lot of people in the rural areas, most of their problem, apart from the fact of, um, that there is lack of access, most of their problem is also psychological. Most people believe that there's a spiritual angle to everything. That, you know, for you to have safe delivery, you know, I must, you must do something. spiritually, I must be okay. I must be able to take care of my spiritual life because people are out there fighting against me, they don't want me to give birth and things like that. I don't want me to have a successful delivery. You know, so they believe more in these people. They believe that, you know, these people can help them. They can, number one, take the delivery. Number two, they can take care of the spiritual aspects of their delivery so they can wade off evil spirits, you know, things like that. They can ensure that no evil surrounds them when they are giving birth and things. So they, they have so much confidence in these people. Then customs too, you know, because they feel their grandparent gave birth to their mother in the place of a traditional birth attendant and she's alive, you know, and give birth, their mother gave birth to them in the place of a traditional birth attendant and they are alive and doing well. So why should they go to the hospital? You know, where someone will be harsh, where someone will talk down at them, where, you know, they have, have... We've worked in a community where people had to fetch water to the health center because the health center does not have water. And if you are going to make use of any health service, then you either buy bags of pure water or you fetch water in advance of medical treatment. Okay. So tell me, what is Brown Buttons doing about maternal health care? Since we started in 2011, we started by training traditional bed attendants. When I say train, I mean we go into the communities. We work with the... So now you're training somebody who already thinks they're competent. Yes. Does that pose any problems for you? Not really, because we don't, we don't go there as um, someone trying to change their system fundamentally. We go there to work with them. We tell them we want to help them improve their services. Okay. Now that's a better way to get their okay, acceptance. Okay. You know, we tell them we want to help them to work better. We want to help them to get government attention and things like that. Mm -hmm. And which is the truth. We help them to get government attention. Because whether you like it or not, there are some areas where even if you place a hospital opposite their houses, they still will go to the place of traditional better attendant. They still okay. would not walk into those hospitals. Mm -hmm. You know, so by setting up linkages, which is what we do, we set up linkages between the traditional better attendants and the skilled birth attendants. By setting up these linkages, we are gaining the confidence of both the skilled birth attendants and the traditional better attendants. What this means in essence is that the skilled birth attendants can help monitor the activities of this traditional birth attendant such that where he notices or where the traditional birth attendant encounters difficulty in a delivery, he can call on this skilled birth attendant to say, look, this patient is, this is not a simple delivery. This is more than evil spirits. This requires serious medical attention and maybe surgery. I think you should take a look at this. And then because we have sent up the leakages, the skilled birth attendant goes, take a look at it and automatically works a transfer, you know, for the patient and help ensure that the patient is alive, the mother is alive to watch her baby grow. That, that is our own focus. A mother should be alive to watch her baby grow. It's, it's a joy that every mother deserves. Okay. Um, we're going to come back to you in a moment and, and, and ask what brown buttons do, but we're taking a quick break. Viewers, stay tuned to the heart of the matter. We'll be back in a moment.
Welcome back to the Heart of the Matter, where we're talking about maternal mortality and child health. Our guest today is Adekwe Jujayoba, and um, she's been talking, and first of all, explain to us what brown buttons do. Brown buttons um, trains traditional birth attendants, also helps train skilled birth attendants, and what else do you do? Well, in our work, we discovered that the issues relating the problem of maternal mortality is not just restricted to training. There is the an access to medical care. There is the issue of having the right tools at childbirth. You know, because we've seen situations where, for instance, when we went to Zamfara, we, we've seen a situation where um, a traditional birth attendant used a rusted um, blade to cut the umbilical cord of a baby, and that baby had neonatal tetanus. That baby is dead right now. You know, that baby is dead now. So we, we, we've had those kind of situations. We've had instances where a midwife had had, she has had to use her mouth to suck out um, mucus from the nose of a newborn because there was no mucus extractor. We've had instances where a baby becomes infected, you know, as a result of the um, birth process. For instance, people give birth, like when we went to Zamfara, people actually give birth on the floor. They give birth on, the, there's, no, there's no bed. They give birth on the floor in the capital of the city. You know, so we've had, we've seen those situations and we feel that, you know, there are things that we can do to actually change this. So we came up with a mother's delivery kit. You know, our mother's delivery kit contains basically the essential a woman needs at childbirth. So if you want to deliver, for instance, you don't need to start running around to go to the pharmacy to say, uh, cut me five pieces of gauze that is not sterilized. Cut me, uh, give me uh, two pieces of delivery mat that is not sterilized. What we do is we've worked with different manufacturers who do these things. We've also, we also have our own medical team that now sterilizes each of these equipment and we pack them together in a kit. So every woman at delivery is just prepared to get it. That kit is enough for delivery. You so have... how do you fund this? Well, presently, we do not have any funders and we've been in existence since 2011. I'll just say everything is by the grace of God. That's just the truth. It, it's by not giving up. The thing is, I'm a lawyer, I'm a trained lawyer. So aside from running the foundation, I have people who say, oh, um, lawyer, look up this agreement for me, and then they pay me. And then this money I used to run the foundation. This money I used to put together the kids, I used to fund our activities, I used to do different things to make the organization work in the rural community. Because the truth is, these people in rural communities cannot pay us. They can't pay us, and we don't expect them to pay us for the services, we are trying to make life better for them. We don't expect to be you, You've gone as far afield as Zamfara, you just mentioned, Zamfara yes, State. we've worked in different states. So, so, so what's your experience? We, Where are the problems mainly concentrated? In the north. The problems are mainly concentrated in the north. In the north, like when we worked in Katina. You know, we, we see all these strange things and hear these strange stories from the north. We experience this strangeness, you know, from the north, the northern part of the country. Now, what can government do, both at local, state, and federal level, to improve maternal mortality? The, the truth is, government is trying. I say they are trying because I know that they've taken some, some steps, you know, in that regard. They've, they have this midwife scheme. They understand too that the problem is in the rural areas. So they have a midwife scheme where every woman, it's, it's like the youth service, where every woman, every midwife is posted to the rural area, you know, to go and stay there for a year, you know, and that's what they do to all their um, graduates of nursing school. They send them to rural areas. Now the issue is, are there enough incentives for them to stay there? Okay. That, that, that's the major problem. These people go there, you know, and then after one month, two months, they are not being paid. After one month, two months, they want green, in their head, they want greener pastures. That's how one month, two months, they are questioning their life and saying, is this what I read nursing for? Is this how I'm going to end up? You know, and then it's about dedication. They no longer become committed to the course that they were initially posted, you know, to a particular location to do and then start looking for other things. So, so what things like is that. it, what is it that will keep them incentivized, if you like, mm -hmm. to, to stay in the rural settings for the one year they're supposed to be there? For that, I, I would say, first of all, it's about the person. But if you cannot work with the person, you know, I think it's, it should be a combined effort of the local community and the government. You know, when the local, for instance, we, we've worked in a community where we were housed for the period that we were training the, um, the birth attendants. We were housed there. We were fed. We were 
we felt welcome. If they do this, and I, I felt in my mind that if they do this for the midwives that come around to their locality and they feel welcomed, you know, so they that house is the them. people they, in the locality. Yes. What about their salaries? I mean, if you haven't been paid the salary. The, the salaries need to be paid. That, that's just the truth. Their salaries need to be paid. And not just being paid, it needs to be paid on time. time. Mm -hmm. What else can the government do? The government would also need to educate, apart from the midwives, they need to educate, they need to spend more on educating the women in the rural communities. Because whether you like it or not, even if you post 100 midwives to some locations in Nigeria, the people will not still go to the hospital and you'll just be paying the midwife for doing no work. You know, they need to change, the, there's supposed to be a reorientation of these people. And the orientation is more than running adverts on TV that these people don't watch. You know, it's more than that. It's about using those midwives in the community as change agents themselves. Letting them educate the people. Not just waiting for them. People won't come into the hospital, but let them go out to meet these people. Talk to them. Educate them. You know, you, they, you take the healthcare system to them at their own convenience. You run a mobile clinic kind of setting for Auntie Napa. A woman who has to feed her family, who has to work with her husband in the farm, will not remember Auntie Napa. You know, but you can take the antenatal to her. You can run a mobile clinic in a market square, for instance. You know, that, that's just an instance. Then we are currently working on a project that has to do with using mobile technology for change. And what this means is that because if you look at the data, the statistics in Nigeria, lots more and more people are, you know, having basic, simple mobile phones. You, you can use those phones to reach these women. So you use the simple tool in the hands of these women to connect them to the healthcare services they desperately need. All right, now let's go to child health care. Mm -hmm. um, a mother has a baby. By the grace of God, she survives the, 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 the childbirth. Now we have an infant. What are you doing? What can the nation do to address this problem? Child mortality is, child, is tied to maternal mortality. Yeah. So I believe that if we take care of maternal mortality extensively, child mortality is going to be reduced. They, they, they say that the most dangerous thing in a child's life is the first 24 hours after the child is born. Now, when you look at the situation, when you look at the events that follow, when a woman gives birth in a rural area, in a rural area, you will know that that child surviving 24 hours is essentially by the grace of God. For instance, if you look at a situation where uh, a health center in a rural area has just one bed, you know, and a woman after giving birth is supposed to be under observation for at least 24 hours, you know, but this midwife has two other patients in labor, and this uh, mother, by the grace of God, has delivered. You know, you package that baby and send her home so that you can create the bed for, make it free for the next person, you know, so it's like that. You, it's, a, it's a sequence. The woman goes home and puts her baby in God's hand, you know, with the little information, if any, she has. You know, she breastfeeds the baby and things, life goes on. If the child survives, then fine, then the child is okay. But most times, these children die. These children die because, number one, there is the nutrition factor. That's why breast, um, breastfeeding is being promoted now. You know, there is the nutrition factor. When you breastfeed the baby, that baby is likely to, that baby is going to be healthier. That baby has more chances of staying alive. That baby has less um, risk of contacting infection. You know, so these are things. Promoting breastfeeding is essential. Now that's on one side. Now the other thing that you also need to think about is the process of delivery. When you go to deliver at the place of a traditional birth attendant, for instance, what kind of things are the baby, is the baby exposed to? A TBA that uses a rusty, a rusty blade to cut the umbilical cord, a TBA that raises off a marking touch with water and salt for the next delivery, a TBA that uses the hand that you bare hands to take delivery, you know, no sterile gloves, nothing. A TB, the child is open to all sorts of infection. The traditional medicine don't give immunization. So life continues. That's why you have children with polio, you have they don't go for immunization. The TBAs, truthfully, they are not going to go away. People believe in them. Yes. Okay. They believe in them. They are not going to go away. The best thing will be setting up, a, trying to manage them. You have to set up linkages from there for them. You have to be able to monitor their activities. You have to be able to put them under some kind of control. 
Yeah, we, we have some states, you know, trying to ensure that they are monitored and registered. You have to, it's, you have to be committed. It's a strenuous process and you have to be committed to complete the process. From government's own information, the rate of maternal, maternal mortality has dropped from 704 per 100,000 to 487 per 100,000. That's a, a, a drop of pretty close, it's, it's a drop of about 30%. Is this, is this, is this improvement? Well, you can say it's a, an improvement, but the issue I have with that particular um, statistic is there is a data gap. Where is the data? That's the question. Where, this data, where, where is it? Where was did it, based it come on, from? Yeah, was it based on sampling? I'm sure it was just random sampling. And it must be based on, yeah, fine, government, they've, they've done some things, like the midwife scheme that I've, I've talked about. You know, they, they've posted midwives to the rural areas and things like that. So the data must be from the midwives, you know, the scheme they are running. So po by posting midwives to rural areas, so they believe that, okay, so we posted this one midwife to this rural area, so we believe that with this, the midwife should be able to save 10 children. Whether the midwife actually saves the 10 children is another question. You know, so basically, it's, it's, it's possible based on their own efforts. You know, they, they've done some things, you know, but we know when you go to the field, when you go to the rural areas, this problem stays in the face every day. So your experience is that the rate of, of maternal and child mortality is still unacceptable for a country that is, that is like Nigeria. Absolutely, it is unacceptable. Is there something else you would like to do beyond what you are able to do right now? Yeah, definitely. It will be one of the things that we aim to do and that we are currently working on is the issue of the mobile technology I told you about. Okay. You know, that, that's because when you look at the data, over 140 million Nigerians have cell phones. And that is, like, that is, it means that the basic mobile phones are accessing places where healthcare services are finding it difficult to access. That means that by, by linking both of them up, you know, you can as well deal with the issue of maternal mortality and other healthcare problems. You know, you can give people health information and you, you can have their healthcare. So, so their maybe, maybe watching this is somebody who runs one of the um, mobile service Provider, uh, providers. Yes. Is there anything else you want from me? Um, we we'll also like the government, we'll, like we we'll work the government at different levels. We would like to work with more governments at different levels, especially in the northern part of the country. You know, because we believe that we work with, in, with the government in Castina State, for instance, you know, and we'll be going back there for, we go back there for monitoring and evaluation because they use our team to monitor their um, TBAs there. You know, we would want a situation where this the training of traditional birth attendants and the setting up of linkages is taken more seriously by government. You know, it's not just about running an NGO, it's not just about um, improving uh, um, healthcare services with your mouth. It's about identifying the root causes of an issue and then tackling it from the roots and not just by, um, by, by cutting it on the head. You know, so we would like, we'd like to see a situation where we work more with more, we'll work with more government um, agencies to be able to get to the real people who actually need this help. Okay. Well, um, Adekwaju, it's been, it's been great having you on the Heart of the Matter. Um, and, and we would really like to see uh, the maternal, maternal mortality rates nosedive. Um, and, and, you know, many of our viewers would want to get involved with what you're doing, get in touch with you, and we're going to put your, your details on the screen. So please contact Adekwaju um, to be able to support and help her in whatever way you can. Uh, thanks ever so much for coming to be with us on the Heart of Thank the Matter. You for having me. You're welcome to, to be here and we'd love to have you again some other time. Thank you. Uh, viewers, we'll be back again next week with another episode of the Heart of the Matter. Until then, stay blessed. Thank you.